Okay, welcome back. Uh, let's carry on with our discussion of evolutionary uh, robotics. Let's just reorient ourselves in terms of the assignments. So, uh, undergraduates, you're working on assignment two. If you want to push on ahead to assignments three and four, that's, that's fine with us as well. Uh, grad students, you're working on assignments three and four. So, just as a reminder for where we are and where we're going, assignment one was connect the dot bot and simulation. And in assignment two, you're starting to create the body of your robot. The robot is made up of a number of objects, and those objects are attached together with joints, which for our purposes for the moment allow pairs of connected objects to rotate relative to one another. When we specify a joint, we have to indicate the position at which two objects are connected together. And most importantly, we need to specify a joint normal, which specifies the plane through which the pairs of objects will rotate relative to one another. Okay, this is all at the beginning of the, of the simulation, right? You're specifying positions and joint normals and orientations at time step zero. Of course, once your robot starts to move, the positions and the joint normals and everything else will also start to move and rotate. But at that point, the physics engine will take care of all of that for you, right? So just, remember, just as a reminder, as you move forward, all of what you're specifying is what exists at the beginning of the simulation, and then the physics engine takes over from, from there. Any questions about objects, joints? For those of you that are pushing onwards into sensors, neurons, and synapses, any questions there? Yes? Um, is, is that evolution going to be available this week? Uh, is, is the evolution assignment going to be available this week? Maybe. I'm going to uh, write it tomorrow. If I finish it tomorrow, <laughs> it will appear tomorrow. Uh, otherwise, it'll be Monday. Okay. Glad to hear people are keen to push on. Okay, so uh, that's the assignments. Um, today we are going to finish our discussion about embodied cognition. And just as a reminder, we're looking at some of the building blocks of intelligence like pattern recognition and planning. And we're looking at approaches to trying to create machines that exhibit that building block of intelligence from a disembodied point of view and from an embodied point of view. Uh, when we finish lecture three today, I think pretty much everything you're going to see in the rest of the course is obviously from the embodied point of view. We're going to be creating robots or looking at experiments, uh, including robots that have both a body and uh, a brain. And evolution is going to try and tune the body and brains of these robots together to try and get the robot to exhibit whatever building block of intelligence we're interested in. OK. Uh, we should finish lecture three after a few minutes today. And we'll then move on into the second theme of the course, which is tools uh, of the trade. And again, we've already touched on a few of these items already. But these are really going to start to come to the forefront now in the next few assignments. Three main tools of the trade we need is obviously we need to simulate some kind of brain for our robot, otherwise known as an artificial neural network, and we'll get into that uh, today. Then we're going to wrap our robotic simulation uh, in an evolutionary algorithm, and the evolutionary algorithm is going to tune the brain and the body of the robot to do whatever we like. And as you've already, as you've already uh, got some experience with here, Already, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on under the hood of Pyrosim, the physics engine that lies underneath Pyrosim. Uh, I haven't updated the schedule from last year. Last year, uh, the students were using the bullet physics engine. The physics engine that underlies Pyrosim is open dynamics engine. So I'll change the reading there uh, to the ODE uh, user manual. But we'll talk about that when we get to lecture six. OK, so that's where we are and where we're going. Uh, the reading for today comes from the main textbook for the class, which is Biologically Inspired uh, AI. As I mentioned, that book is on loan uh, in the library. When I get back to my office after class today, I will post a PDF of just those pages from the, the textbook. So if you're interested, again, in just reading up on the, just reading the readings drawn from the textbook, I'll put up the PDFs as we go. If you're interested in reading the book as a whole, you can find it in the library. Okay, 
Any other questions about schedules, assignments? We're all good? OK, so back to lecture three. And again, we're trying to build up an, an understanding for this idea of embodied cognition by looking at disembodied and embodied approaches to AI. So we looked at recognizing faces or people in images. The disembodied approach, we have a computer program. We supply it with millions of photographs that do or do not contain a person or do or do not contain Marilyn Monroe and train that computer, train that computer program to tell us whether there is a person in that image or not. Right? But in some way, that, al that algorithm or that computer program is at a disadvantage because it can't interact with the physical world. So we looked at COG last time. Uh, and COG is able to reach out and literally push against its world and observe how the world pushes back. Right? And we spent quite a bit of time last time talking about how this feedback loop, and this feedback loop is ACT, sense the repercussions of your action, think about those sensory repercussions, decide what to do next, and around and around you go. That feedback loop which generates this sensor motor data, when I move, I see this black blob or this blob of motion in my field of view. That sensor motor data that relates sensation to action provides the raw material to start to learn about the world around you. Right? Okay, uh, we talked about pattern recognition. Uh, we talked about planning last time. We looked at uh, Deep Blue, which is this disembodied computer, which builds this huge min-max tree. If I move my white pawn like this, then my opponent might move their black knight like this, and so on uh, and so forth. Right? That was a disembodied approach to planning. And then we looked at an embodied approach to planning, Shaky the robot, which scans its environment, uh, makes a model of that environment, and then plans some way to get out of that uh, environment. Uh, last time I skipped over these three slides, so let's come back to these three slides for a moment. These, these are kind of uh, interesting and just sort of an aside here. Um, another important aspect that you might argue of an intelligent entity is the ability to decide to do something, otherwise known as uh, free will. Has anybody uh, heard of the Libet experiment before? Few people? Okay. So for those of you that haven't, this was a very interesting and as you can imagine, very controversial study back in the uh, early 1980s. Um, they invited a bunch of human subjects uh, into the lab and the human subjects were instrumented with an EEG uh, sensors on the scalp. Anybody know what EEG stands for? Uh, that's right, electroencephalography, which picks up electrical activity near the surface of the skull. So it gets some of what the brain is doing, but it has to be the part of the brain that's near uh, the skull. And they then took the four fingers of the human subjects and they wrapped uh, an EMG sensor around it. So electromyography picks up uh, muscle uh, activation. So the moment you send signals to the muscles and the muscles contract, an EMG signal picks up on it. Okay, so we've got uh, a human who's wearing some EEG and an EMG, and these human subjects were asked to perform the following task. The subjects were asked to look at a clock, and on the clock there was a moving red dot, and the subjects were asked to decide of their own free will at any time they wanted to move their finger and the one request was that when you decide to move your finger, actually move your finger. So don't try and trick the experimenters here by thinking about deciding to move your finger and then not moving your finger. When you decide, you were asked to actually do it. We'll assume that the subjects actually followed uh, the rules here. They were asked to remember by looking at the red dot that was moving around the clock face to remember exactly when they made the decision to move their finger and to tell the experimenter. Okay, so they did this with lots of different people and obviously they decided at different times when to actually uh, move their finger. And they found that more or less about 200 milliseconds after the subjects reported that they had decided to move their finger, their finger actually moved. The EMG sensor recorded that 200 milliseconds after that reported time, their fingers 
uh, actually, actually moved. And they also found that uh, at the time at which the subjects decided to move their finger for each individual subject, there was a particular pattern that always showed up. So this, each subject did this multiple times and decided at different times to move their fingers. And whenever they, they did, there was some pattern in the EEG signal that was constant for that subject that always showed up. Now that pattern was different, again, across subjects. But the, in essence, the researchers could see the subjects say they moved their finger at t equals 3. And at t equals 3, there was this particular pattern in their EEG. And 200 milliseconds later, uh, their fingers moved. Right? Looks good, right? There's something going on in the brain, and they're capturing at least part of it with EEG, which is the decision to move your finger. So far, so good. Right? They also noticed that 300 milliseconds before the subjects reported that they had decided to move their finger, there was some other pattern in the EEG that was constant, constant for that subject. So if, if I did this experiment four times, and I chose four different times to move my finger, there, were, there was a particular pattern in my EEG signal that always showed up 300 milliseconds before I decided to move my finger. I thought I moved it at t equals 0, but it seems that my brain had made the decision to move my finger 300 milliseconds earlier. Does this bother you at all? Is, is this the, uh, from the delay uh, from sight versus brain processing? Nope, because you are... You are looking at the clock, so it's speed of light of the photons from the red dot to your eyes to the, the decision. So it's not enough. There's not enough of a delay there, right? 300 milliseconds is a pretty big delay. I just, when you decide to move your finger, so are they looking at a clock or just a red dot on a line? They're looking at a red dot that's moving around an actual clock face. So I'm looking at the clock. I see it's at... You know, one second, two second, three seconds, and at three seconds, I decide to move my finger. Three, uh, three seconds minus 300 milliseconds. So 300 milliseconds earlier, the investigators knew that I was going to make that decision. So it's at three seconds, they decide, and not they're looking at the clock and be like, okay, at that time, I plan on moving my finger. They were asked very carefully to try and clear your mind and then just arbitrarily <laughs> make the decision to move. Move your finger and remember the, that time at which you, you did it. Okay. Now, you're right. Some of the subjects may have planned ahead, right? It's a little tricky. So again, we're assuming that they were following the instructions carefully. Then it feels like there's no free will if three milliseconds prior to your own decision, it was already decided for you. Most people who hear about this experiment for the first time, it's a little bit depressing, right? You decided at three seconds. Who is this person who actually made the decision 300 milliseconds earlier? Is this one experiment enough to explode your idea that you have free will? Could that be like your lack of confidence? Sort of, I'm going to move it, and then after 300 milliseconds, your body commits at that point. Maybe. Or then you have like a whole branch of options. Perhaps, right? But it was pretty constant across subjects, right? So maybe one person was not quite sure. They made a decision, and it took them a while. There's, there's obviously noise in this data. With enough subjects, it looked pretty constant. Maybe all the subjects were told what they had to do, so they all had this sort of idea that they were going to do something, like their finger, or moving their finger at one point. So maybe it's sort of like backed up and set up like that for that sort of scenario. I don't know. I guess maybe I don't quite. Well. OK. Like, like a cat. Sorry? Like, like a cache. cache. Like I've made a decision and it's a little bit earlier? Okay. They understand the uh, action they're going to perform it, so maybe the brain already has a preset idea of what that movement is. So the brain already has a preset idea, and you become aware of it 300 milliseconds later, right? But if the brain, your brain, has already made the decision and you're not conscious of it, how is it free will? Did you make the decision? Well, I guess you made the decision that you're going to move your finger. So the, the brain enacts that decision at a given time. But you were aware of it at this time. 
right? But the decision seems to have been made 300 milliseconds earlier. Now, you made it. It occurred somewhere in your brain. But you, or the subjects, weren't aware of it. Is it still you? Um, what's the typical like? Does it have, like, tiny tick marks? Yes. There may have been just kind of like this subconscious it's possible, right? So maybe the experimental design wasn't perfect, and there may be something, and there may be some flaw in the experiment that accounts for this 300 uh, millisecond. Again, there's been a lot of study of this study, as you can imagine. It's very controversial. People are pretty invested in whether this is a whether these results are real or not. Right? This is your free will on the line. Hopefully, this this matters to you. Would do you think the 300 milliseconds would remain constant if? Given more options other than move your finger, it's move your arm left, right, up, or down? There have been a lot of follow-up studies to do this, and again, we don't have time in this class to go into the whole literature that's grown up around the Libet study. As you can imagine, if you're a cognitive scientist or a psychologist or a neuroscientist, this would be a pretty interesting experiment to try and redo or disprove or improve upon or, or what have you. Right? So, uh, my goal this morning is not to try and convince you that you don't have free will. The point of that I, the reason why I show the Libetic uh, study at the beginning of a robotics class is that thinking about thinking is misleading, right? I have free will, it's obvious. I decided at t equals 3 to move my finger, that's when I decided, right? I know it, it's so obvious. Not everything about introspection is so obvious. When we think about our own thinking, it's tricky, right? So uh, I recognize Marilyn Monroe, you know, in, in 100 milliseconds. It's trivial, right? Back in 1956, it's easy for me to do it. If you give us a little bit of money in two months, we'll, we'll figure out how to, how to do this, right? It feels like a lot of the building blocks of intelligence are easy because they're easy for us. Right? Turns out that they're extremely difficult to build into computers, and whether this particular building block of intelligence will ever be built into computers is perhaps a question of philosophy and not so much computer science or, or engineering. Right? So again, you can take the Libet experiment with a grain of salt. If you're interested, by all means, go have a look. But I want you to remember as we go along that thinking about thinking is misleading. So when I talk about pattern recognition, right? It's not really clear how the brain does this. Actually, now, after the deep learning revolution, we seem to have a little bit better idea about how the brain does pattern recognition. But other aspects are still pretty mysterious, right? How we plan um, is tricky. How we make a decision to do something, also a little bit tricky and somewhat mysterious. Okay, so I just wanted to, again, put that disclaimer out there. We'll come back and see that quite a bit in a lot of the robotics experiments that try and embody a particular aspect of cognition in a machine. It's tricky. Okay, so we ended last time by talking about Shaky the robot. At this, at this point in time, back in the 60s and early 70s, people said, well, we plan all the time. We sit here, we scan the room, we plan, we make a model of the room, we then plan a path to get to the door, and then we execute it, right? Turns out that doesn't work very well, or at least it didn't work well for 60s technology. It still doesn't work well for current technology because even with modern computers, it's slow. I have to sense, then I have to model, then I have to plan, then I have to act. The moment I act, my model of the world changes, so I have to update my model, and so on and so forth. Right? Not a very, in retrospect, that's probably not how we plan. It might feel like that's the way you plan, but maybe that's not really how we plan. Perhaps, what we probably do is something that's much more parallel, right? So we ended last time with Rod Brooks's subsumption architecture, uh, a version of which exists in all the robot vacuum cleaners, all of the, the Roombas. Uh, Roombas don't really plan so much, but they do try and uh, perform different behaviors, and some of these behaviors are more important than, than others, right? You should never smash into an obstacle, but as long as you're not very close to an obstacle, as reported by your obstacle sensors, you can do other things, like avoid loud noise, follow the light, or explore, and if you're a vacuum cleaner and you explore, you'll eventually clean all of the floor, 
But as you're exploring, if, you sudden, if an obstacle suddenly appears that's close by, the avoid obstacle behavior subsumes or shuts off the control of the exploration uh, component on your motors, right? So the more urgent thing seizes control of the motors and takes over, right? Okay, you can sit here quietly and learn about robotics unless some other urgent matter arises for you and your body will tell you when that need arises and uh, you'll take care of it, right? Okay, so that's subsumption architecture. So um, we're going to spend quite a bit of time in this course talking about embodied cognition. And basically embodied cognition is a pretty straightforward idea. It means you have a body with which to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. And you use the raw material gener or the raw data generated by that action sensory loop to learn things about the world, right? So um, you could argue that computers are embodied in a trivial sense because they exist in a physical object, but my laptop cannot really use its metal frame here to affect the world and sense how the world pushes back, right? It can, in a limited sense, it can make a sound which attracts me, and I type something on the keyboard. So in limited sense, it can sort of interact with this environment. But we're going to assume for this course that phones and laptops and desktops are not really embodied. We're going to talk about robots which can really move themselves or move things in the world and sense the repercussions of those actions. Okay. So there's some interesting repercussions of anything or anyone that's embodied, regardless of whether it's a human, an animal, or a robot. So um, if you have a mod, for one, one repercussion of this is that if you do move and you can see or you can sense in some way, the, the minute you move, you get immediate feedback, right? So there's this real-time nature to embodied machines. This is very different from a computer that sends a packet out over the internet and waits for something to, to come back. If you have a body and you have sensors, you move, you immediately <laughs> register the repercussion of that, that action in real time. Right? That's not really a limitation, that's an opportunity that you can exploit as an embodied agent to learn about the world and survive uh, in the world. Okay, so non-embodied technologies, they kind of have to wait. So you can already start to see how an embodied agent has some advantages over a disembodied uh, device. Okay, there is a related concept to embodied cognition, which is situated cognition. Um, and again, as this term implies, situated cognition is the idea that you're situated in the world. And situated, we're going to just use as sort of a synonym for the fact that you have sensors. Whatever is happening in the world, you're able to sense in real time some aspect of that environment. Right? Our sensors don't cover the entire electromagnetic spectrum, so there are some things happening out there in the world that we miss, but we're capturing in real time certain sensory flows, right? auditory uh, information, and the visible spectrum of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. Okay, so an example of a technology that is situated is an embedded device. So if you go over to the Davis Center and you're sitting in one of the conference rooms over there, and if you're very still for a while, the lights will turn off. If you move again, the lights will turn on, right? So there's an embedded device uh, in most of the rooms in the Davis Center that are looking for motion, and if they don't detect any motion for a while, they'll turn the lights off. Right? So that's a device which is situated. It's getting information from the real world in real time. In this case, it's motion data, and then it's doing something uh, based on that. Okay. So again, re there are some certain repercussions of situated devices, which is, again, they're receiving their information in real time. Right? There isn't sort of some cue, and then they're processing that cue as they go. There's information arriving at the sensor in, in real time. A situated device might then take that real-time information and put it in some queue and process that information uh, at its leisure, but the information, assuming it has a sensor, is arriving in real time. It can't slow down the speed at which data is arriving at the sensor. Okay, okay. so that's a situated uh, device. If we put these two things together, if we talk about either a machine or an animal or a human which is both embodied, push against the world, 
and situated observes how the world pushes back. We're going to refer to these as complete agents. So they, they are able to engage in this complete uh, cycle uh, of interaction with the environment. And again, there's some interesting repercussions of a complete agent. And there are actually five repercussions that are mentioned in the reading associated with Lecture 3. We're going to just focus on uh, the first three uh, today. So the first one is obviously if you have a body, you're subject to the laws of physics, which might seem like a disadvantage, right? You're kind of captured by physics, where a computer that's disembodied and lives only in the internet or only lives in virtual spaces doesn't have these shackles of the physical world attached to it. But as you're going to see as we go through this course, being subject to the laws of physics is not always a disadvantage. It can also be an opportunity that you can exploit. What might some of those opportunities be, and how might a robot or how might an animal exploit those opportunities? Uh, physics allows you to do things much more efficiently. How so? What do you mean by efficiently? Uh, if you are a robot that was trying to dig towards the center of the Earth, having gravity affect you is going to be drastically more helpful than just trying to do it with just motion. Absolutely, right? So if we need to move downward somehow, you sort of get that for free. If you dig out material underneath you, physics will take care of making sure that you continue on a downward path. Right? Other examples? You're trying to produce heat, okay. and friction will drastically help you than just trying to do it by really anything that physics can affect you with that can emit an energy. Yes, uh, it's much easier to do using physics than just trying to do it by yourself. Absolutely right. So you can't get away from generating heat through friction as you as you move. You might choose to move in different ways to produce more or less, but you're going to produce some somehow, right? Okay. Later in the course, we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about legged locomotion, in particular, our form of legged locomotion, which is bipedal or two-legged locomotion. Um, if we were to create a robot with two legs and we're going to program it to walk, we could program it to lift its leg, put its leg forward, put its leg down, and then repeat that with the other leg. Or we could realize that we have an embodied agent on our hands that has two legs. And if we get the robot to get one leg off the ground, what happens? Unstable. Sorry? It's unstable. It's unstable. So I shifted my weight onto what's known as my stance leg. And now this leg, which is trailing behind, comes off the ground. This is the stance leg. What happens to this leg that's behind me? Because of physics. It gets picked up, it gets pulled off the ground because my weight has shifted forward. This leg comes off the ground, and now what happens? It'll move towards the center. It'll move towards the center, why? Absolutely, right? So my back leg, known as the swing leg, right, comes off the ground. My hip is a one degree of freedom rotational joint, which we talked about last time. And as long as I relax the muscles in my leg at the moment my foot comes off the ground, physics will do the rest for me, right? My swing leg becomes a pendulum and will passively swing forward. I don't need to send commands to my muscles to actively swing my foot forward, right? As my foot swings forward, what happens? Again, without me, without my brain sending commands to my legs, what happens? thanks to physics. Balance shift. The balance shifts, so my center of mass moves forward, and now? Your balance yeah. your swing leg different. So I, I swing forward, yep. You tip onto the swing leg. I tip onto the swing leg, right? So this is now no longer the swing leg, it's the stance leg. I feel the fact that my heel has impacted the ground. Now I tense the muscles in my leg rock over them, and repeat. So when you leave class today, pay attention to the muscles in your legs. Just walk naturally. And try and feel when you're tensing and relaxing the muscles in your legs. And if you pay attention, you'll notice that you're actually relaxing the muscles in your leg for about half the time. Right. So when your leg is a swing leg, you're relaxed. 
When it's on the ground, it's tensed so you don't fall down. So that's nice, right? We get walking almost for free, right? Physics is helping us here. There's another advantage to exploiting physics and bipedal locomotion above and beyond the fact that my brain doesn't figure out, doesn't need to figure out how to send all the commands to my swing leg. What's the other obvious advantage here? So physics helps me to simplify the commands that I send to my legs. But what else is it? There's another advantage to the fact that I'm exploiting gravity here. You're doing less work? Doing much less work, right? So um, on half a Big Mac, maybe not all of you are, are carnivores, but if you do eat half a Big Mac, you can travel, you can walk, most of us can walk about 20 miles. It's amazing. We are one of the most efficient uh, energy to displacement machines out there. Cars are a little bit better than us, but they cheat by using these round things and roll, right? We are incredibly efficient uh, locomotive machines, and there's some interesting ideas out, out there about why we evolved to be so. But again, by exploiting, because we are, exploit, uh, we are embodied agents, we exploit, we don't fight physics, we exploit it as we move. It simplifies what our brain needs to do, and it makes us much more energy efficient. Okay, so we already saw uh, the case that when we move, we generate sensory stimulation. How might we, or how might a machine, exploit that? When I move, I sense something. When is that information useful? We've actually already seen a robot that exploits this particular property of being embodied and situated. To explore the surrounding environment? Yes, so we could use it to explore the surrounding environment, but can we be a little bit more specific, right? So I could sit still and just receive sensory information, and that's useful, but it's even more useful when I do something and sense the repercussion of that action. Uh, you can associate your change in space to the change in Absolutely, right? So I did that. Whatever the sensory repercussion is, I had a role in it, right? So you remember COG, which would move and then sense that moving blob in its field of view, right? It knows that there's something special about that moving blob compared to the other moving blob, which was the apple. The apple might move even when COG isn't moving, right? So the fact that you can generate sensory stimulation as a result of your action helps you start to learn about the world and explore the world uh, around you. Okay, so when I act, I not only sense the repercussions of those actions, but I often have an impact on the environment itself. Why might that be a useful property? As an intelligent agent, why would I care about the fact that when I act, I might leave an imprint literally or figuratively on the world. Like if you were on an assembly line and a robot accidentally ran into someone, it yep. needs to understand the collision person. That's going to be particularly important, right? If you're a social robot, you're working in close proximity to other humans, you better know that you're having an impact on a specific aspect of the environment, which is the humans nearby. That's imp it's important to know the, that you are having an impact but what we're looking for here is, can you think of a machine or an organism that exploits the fact that it has an impact on the environment? It not only knows that it does, but it uses that fact to carry out some useful action in the real world. Probably just about every animal. Okay. Give me an example of an animal that does something and uses, exploits the fact that it's impacting its environment. Well, uh, humans build things and exploit their environment. Okay, yeah, absolutely. We build things. So it just snowed yesterday. There's a clue. Let's think about us. We're cleaning up the car. What's that? The car was freezing and we were cleaning it up. We have to clean the car. Okay, we're having an impact <laughs> on the environment, getting the snow off the car. That's not the particular behavior I'm looking for. Like plowing roads and affecting nature? Uh, yes. Yes. Let me give you another hint. Right. It snowed yesterday. When you finish class here, you're going to probably run to another building where you have another class. Probably want to get there in a relatively efficient manner. What happens? What happens on campus always the day after it snows? Because you're walking around campus. 
you're having an impact on the environment. Oh, okay. So like we'll create a shortcut? We create a shortcut, right? So all the shortest paths between the buildings on campus suddenly are visible again because we're because all of us are collectively running between the buildings and most of the time we're following the shortest path. You by walking impact the snow. And when you do, you leave a path, right? And often you leave the shortest path, which the next complete agent or the next student running from one building to another will follow, right? We collectively lay down these shortest paths between buildings by leaving a signal in the environment, right? So someone who came to campus today who's never been to UVM before, and if they wanted to get to a particular building, they could just follow your footprints in the snow, right? They could exploit the fact that someone before them has already impacted the, the environment. Okay, again, we'll see lots of examples as we go forward of robots that exploit the fact that they or their fellow robots are impacting the environment. Okay, so let's finish lecture three here by again thinking about situated and non-situated agents and embodied and disembodied agents. So we're going to try and fill in the four cells of this matrix here. Give me an example of some technologies that are both disembodied and non-situated. Okay, not quite, right? It used to be the fact that our phones were non-embodied and non-situated. They're, they're definitely non-embodied, right? They can't really use their body very much, but... A desktop, right? Because our phones have some sensors in them, right? So assuming that you allow the sensors on your phone to be on 24-7, you have a non-embodied but situated device, right? A desktop machine is a pretty good example of a disembodied and non-situated device. Your desktop computer might have some internal sensors, like when the battery is, is flatting out. But other than that, it's not really recording data from the real world in real time. Okay, so our phones are situated and non-embodied. You think of some other technologies that are situated and non-embodied? We just mentioned some a few slides back. Embedded devices. Embedded devices, right? So the light sensors over in the data center they're situated, they're detecting motion in real time, and they're non-embodied. They don't have a body through which they can impact the world. You could argue that they're minimally embodied. They're not quite completely disembodied. Why are they minimally embodied? Well, that's, that's situatedness, right? So they can detect motion. Actually, the light sensors in the data center cannot detect light. They only detect motion. So that's all they really need, right? But they, how are they minimally embodied? They're connected to the lights. They're connected to the lights, right? They can turn the lights on and off. So they can impact the environment in this minimal sense, right? They don't, the, the sensors themselves, the embedded devices in the room don't actually move. So most of the time when we're talking about embodied devices, we're really talking about embodied devices that have a body that they can use to move or move themselves or a robot arm that can move around its environment. Right? So for most purposes, let's consider embedded devices situated but non-embodied. Okay, this cell can be a little bit tricky. Embodied but non-situated. Manufacturing robots? Manufacturing robots, right? So. Uh, at least older manufacturing robots were programmed with a body, so the robot arm would move and weld the car door over and over again, but would not sense the repercussion of that welding action, right? Automated factories are built so that the car arrives at the robot in exactly the same position every time. So everything is kept constant so that the robot can just do what it does very fast, and with a huge amount of force and not care about the repercussions of its action, right? As long as humans are taken out of the loop and everything happens the same thing, same way every time, the robot can just do the same thing over and over again. Most modern manufacturing or industrial robots also now have sensors, so they're becoming situated as well. Okay, what about the bottom right cell, embodied and situated? Animals. Animals, right? Us. Right? So uh, us, animals, when I, 
when we talk about robots in the rest of this course, we're going to assume that we're not talking about industrial robots. We're talking about robots that can move and sense the repercussions of the, their actions. So robots for us, for the rest of this course, are going to be both situated and uh, embodied. Okay, so if you uh, forget the difference between embodied and disembodied or situated and non-situated, this is a good slide to come back and consult. Okay, any questions about embodied cognition before we carry on? Yes? So for the disembodied, not situated, so a computer with internal speakers, would it, that wouldn't count. That would be, that'd be embodied, right? It would be minimally embodied, right? So it can send out pressure waves into the air using its speakers. Okay. Yes, it has some impact on its environment. Right. So again, a lot of these things, it's a little bit blurry, right? But, um, but for most of the time, the differences are pretty clear. Uh, I forgot to mention this one, avatars. So we might have a virtual human or a virtual representation of a human in a video game like an avatar or a virtual robot in a virtual environment. It's not physical, but it is still embodied and situated, right? An avatar has a virtual body. It can use that virtual body to interact with the virtual environment in which it exists and sense the repercussions of that action in the virtual world. So we can establish this action sensed reaction loop in a virtual world or a physical world, still embodied, right? So you can have things that are embodied and situated, not necessarily physical. Kelly. So the robotics, the evolution um, experiments that you do on the computer, both robots and avatars, because they're virtual? So avatars is just the name for, is usually used in the video game world, right? So there's a version of me in the game somewhere. There's usually a human controlling the avatar, but the human is controlling the avatar, and that avatar acts in the virtual world and gets some sensory reaction for its action in the virtual world. So avatars and simulated robots have the same property. Okay, so that's lecture three, and that concludes our introduction to evolutionary robotics. We're going to come back in a couple lectures to some of the first experiments in evolutionary robotics. But we, before we do, we're going to spend three lectures talking about the tools of the trade because you are in the process of creating those tools yourselves, right? So we're going to start today with artificial uh, neural networks in lecture four. And we're going to build up an understanding of ANNs by starting with some familiar friends. Who are these? The aggressor and the coward. The aggressor and the coward, right? These are two Breitenberg vehicles. When we introduced them last time, they had two sensors and two motors and wires connecting the sensors to the motors. We're going to do something very non-embodied now. We're going to take the body of the vehicles and throw them away. So we're just left with an input layer of sensors and an output layer of motors. So as we go through forward through this lecture now, we're going to see a bunch of these kinds of cartoons where the circles represent neurons. At the input layer, these neurons are capturing values directly from the sensors. So in the case of a cow, the coward over here, you can see that there's more light falling on the right sensor than there is on the left sensor. So if we were to look at the internal values of these two neurons, there is more, uh, there's a larger value inside the right-hand sensor neuron than in the left-hand sensor neuron. And these wires, or these arrows, are going to represent synapses. So in biological nervous systems, synapses are the things that connect neurons <coughs> together. So in our case, uh, our, little, our simple synapse here is just copying this value and placing it in the target neuron. So when we talk about synapses, we're going to talk about a synapse. A synapse always has uh, a source neuron and a target neuron. In these simple synapses, they're just copying their values from their source neuron to their target neuron. So here's our disembodied Breitenberg vehicle. Now we're going to start to add a little bit of complexity. What happens if we start with the aggressor, with the cross wires, and add uh, these direct connections here? Intuitively, you can sort of understand what happens. If you have a neuron down here, and it has more than one arriving synapse, you just take the values that are arriving along those synapses and sum them together. If we were to take this 
artificial neural network and drop it back inside a Breitenberg vehicle body, what would this Breitenberg vehicle do? Not necessarily, right? It's definitely not going to stay still. It's going to go forward. How do you know it's going to go forward? No matter the input, the motor should receive the same. Um, absolutely, right? So it doesn't take much more than simple arithmetic to realize that no matter what values arrive here, the values that arrive at the two motors are always equal, so the robot is always going to go forward. It's never going to turn. Does this robot ever speed up or slow down? Yes, it does, right? Why does it speed up or slow down? What's the conditions for which, under which it will speed up? The, uh, the distance between the light and the sensor. Between the, the light between the, di uh, between the sensors and the light source, right? So what happens when that distance uh, decreases? The speed uh, increase. Right. So when the light source is closer to the sensors, the values here are larger, meaning the two equal values here are larger, and it will speed up. If we pull the flashlight away from the robot, what happens? It slows down. It slows down, right? So the distance between the light source and the sensors is greater. These values, whatever they are, they might still be different, but in general they're lower. So the value, equal values arriving here are lower, the robot moves slower. And you're right, there are conditions under which the robot won't move at all. Total darkness, right? Okay, so we can already see that we've made a change to the artificial neural network. We've added two synapses, and we've changed the robot's behavior again. Right? We already saw this between the coward and the aggressor, but now we're making things a little bit more complicated. Okay, let's introduce an additional detail. So up till now, we've been using this cartoon of this little plus sign, which just means copy the value from here to here. When you get to the synapses project, you're going to see that every synapse has a floating point value uh, associated with it. Uh, for our purposes, we're going to assume that floating point value is always between minus 1 and plus 1. What does this weight do? It modifies the input to the sensors down there. So if you were to say 1.29 equals C, C equals 0.8 times 0.6 plus 0.9 times 0.9. And then plus 0.9 times 0.9, right? So you can see here, we're taking the influence of this source neuron on this target neuron. There's the influence there, 0.6. And we're weighting the influence by this number, right? We're multiplying it by this, uh, by this weight. So a synaptic weight weights the influence of the source neuron on the target neuron. What happens if we set the weight of a synapse to zero? Or you just remove the wire. You're in essence removing the wire, right? The source neuron, if this weight was zero, the influence of this source neuron on this target neuron, even though they're connected, <coughs> the influence is zero, right? It doesn't matter what value arrives at this neuron, it never influences this neuron. So weights that are close to uh, zero uh, re reduce the influence of a given neuron on another neuron. If we increase the weight, increase the magnitude, we're increasing the influence of that source neuron on that um, target neuron. You'll notice also we have positive and negative weights. So a, a synapse that has a positive weight, that means that it is an excitatory synapse. And this kind of makes sense, right? So as the source neuron's value goes more positive, a more positive value by a positive value excites or makes the value here more positive. Right? So if you have an excitatory synapse, a positive weight, when this, one, when this neuron becomes excited, it excites the target neuron. A, a synapse that has a negative weight is known as an inhibitory synapse. So uh, if, we have a, if we have this excited neuron here and we have a negative influence here, then a positive times a negative value means we're drawing the value of this synapse more negatively, right? So 
uh, let's see here, where's that one? 0 0.6 times minus 3, right? That's drawing this value more negative, and it's inhibiting the behavior of the target neuron. So we'll see as we go forward in our discussion of artificial neural networks, we'll see collections of excitatory and inhibitory uh, connections. Okay, so again, what we're doing when we're computing the new value of a target neuron, we're going to iterate over all of the source neurons, and during that iteration or that summation, we're going to take the current value of the source <laughs> neuron, multiply it by the weight, and add it to this running sum, go to the next source neuron, take its value, multiply it by the weight of that synapse, and add it to the sum, and we get this. Okay, if we were to take this neural network and drop it back into a Breitenberg vehicle, what will that vehicle do? Tricky. Depends where the light source is, I guess. Depends where the light source is. Mostly turn right. I've been looking at this slide for 11 years. I still don't know what this vehicle will do, right? Again, this is a very important lesson about cr trying to create behaviors for robots. It doesn't take much, but it doesn't take much complexity in which our int intuition runs out, right? I have no idea what this robot would do. It's very tricky to figure out, given an artificial neural network, to predict what the robot will do. It's also hard to solve the inverse problem. So the for I just described the forward problem to you. I give you a neural network and ask you to predict in forward in time, if we drop this uh, ANN or this brain into the robot, what will it do? It's also hard to solve the inverse problem, which is, I want you to design a robot for me that will approach light, but if it gets uh, within three centimeters of that light, I want it to slow down and stop. I could tell you verbally what I want the robot to do, and I ask you to sit down and come up with the synaptic weights that will get the robot to do that. Very tricky, right? It's the inverse problem. Given a behavior, what are the weights that should produce that behavior? Very, very difficult to do, right? So we're always, in robotics, we're always automating this process somehow. We might use a learning method, which is going to try and set these weights. Or we might use an evolutionary method, which is not just going to set these weights, but also decide which neuron is attached to which other one, and might also change the body of the robot itself. Okay, uh, let's keep going. You'll notice that in, for the left-hand neuron here, uh, the sum is actually greater than 1. So we're not really sure what the magnitude of these, neuron, of these final neurons could be. So in most neural networks, we take that raw sum that we just computed, and before we set the new value of the neuron, we take that raw sum and we pass it through an activation function. Historically, it's called an activation function because this function is going to determine the new value or the new activation level of the neuron. Okay, there are different kinds of activation functions that we might apply. All of them have the same function, which is to squash the value <laughs> to lie between some desired range. As I, as I just mentioned in this course, we're going to assume that all of the synapses range have a value between minus 1 and plus 1. We're going to do the same thing with our neurons. We're going to assume that the neurons also only have a value within the range of minus 1 and plus 1. And we can ensure that by applying a threshold to, or sorry, applying an activation function to this raw sum. Okay, so uh, we can't use the identity function because the identity function would just take the raw sum and output the raw, the raw sum. What happens in a step function here? I'm sorry, I, for, I forgot to mention it. These little cartoons here, imagine that the x value represents the raw sum, and the y value represents the actual value of the neuron, the new value based on this raw sum. So in the identity function, if we take our example from before, we have the raw sum totaling 0.09. So we go to x uh, equals 0.09. We go up and we read off y equals 0.09. We set the new uh, neuron value to that. 
That doesn't work very well because if we use the identity function here, we take 1.29 and we set the new value of the neuron to be 1.29 and we violated this constraint, which is that neuron should always uh, lie between the range of minus 1 and plus 1. What does the step function do for us? Anything less than 0 is negative 1 and anything greater than 0 is 1. Exactly. So if we were to use as our activation function the step function, and we were to take this neural network, drop it back into a Breitenberg vehicle, and let that vehicle run around, and watch the two values here, it would blink on and off between minus 1 and plus 1, and nothing else. right? We could also use a threshold function. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry, in this cartoon here, we're assuming the neurons range between 0, 0, and 1. You could probably rewrite this from minus 1 to plus 1. So, uh, if they're ever less than minus 1, we just uh, clamp that neuron to minus 1. If the raw sum is ever above 1, we set it to 1. If it's between minus 1 and plus 1, we leave the value alone. Okay. It's also the sigmoid function, which you can use uh, in this assignment. We're going to be using the tan h function, the hyperbolic tangent. If you go look up uh, the, uh, the graph for the hyperbolic tangent, you'll see that no matter what x is, it will always squish that value back to a range of minus 1 to plus 1. So far, so good? Okay. Okay, so uh, I just want to pause here and connect this back to the assignments. So for those of you that are working ahead uh, in the synapses assignment on step, uh, let's see, somewhere here, step 25, you're going to come across this equation, uh, which the first time you see it can be a little bit intimidating. So I just want to point out one piece of this equation, which should now look familiar to you. This equation describes what is the new value at time t of the ith uh, target neuron. So remember, we're going to have to compute for a whole bunch of neurons what are their new values. And for each one of those neurons, for each of the ith target neurons, we need to look at all of its incoming synapses. So for each target neuron i, we're going to sum over all of the uppercase J uh, incoming neurons. So I'll try and switch back and forth here between the slides, uh, the slides and the equation. So if this is our ith neuron, what is uppercase J in this case? How many source neurons are there? Two, right? So uppercase J equals two. So we're going to compute, we're going to uh, iterate over two neurons, and we're going to set those source neurons to have an index of lowercase j. So we're going to take the value of the jth source neuron. You'll notice there's a little twist here. We're actually using the value of that source neuron from the previous time step. And the reason why we do that isn't going to come up for quite a while in these assignments, but we'll come back to it. What I want you to take away for the moment is y sub i is a function of all of its uh, input neurons, all of its source neurons, multiplied by WJI. What is WJI here? The weight of the synapse that connects neuron J to neuron I. That's it. Okay. And then you can see we're also then wrapping that sum in the tan H function. And because we have Y sub I equals tan H of this stuff, we know to be sure that y sub i is always going to lie in the range of minus 1 to plus 1. You'll notice there's another little tweak here, but we'll talk about that uh, later. So far, so good? Okay. Okay, so again, I promised you that everything you're going to see in this course henceforth is embodied. I misspoke. Here's a disembodied. Uh, neural network. So again, we could have a whole course on neural networks. We're going to just look at a few short slides to build up an intuition for how these things work. In a robot, an artificial neural network is taking incoming sensory information and transforming it. It's basically a, a mapping function from sensation to action. The values that arrive at the output layer 
of our artificial neural network control the motors. So what sorts of mappings or what sorts of functions can a neural network perform? Well, let's look at a very simple neural network. It's got two input neurons and one output neuron. And we would like to set the weights of this uh, neural network, or we'd like to set the parameters of this neural network to compute uh, a particular logical function. Let's assume for simplicity's sake that our neurons are only ever going to take on values of 0 or 1. So we're going to assume that they're binary. And we want the output neuron to equal 0 when both inputs are 0. When um, either of the inputs is 1, we also want the output to be 1. And only when both inputs are 1 do we want the output to be 1. What logical function is this? And. This is AND, right? We only want an output of 1 when input 1 and input 2 are equal to 1. So we're going to try and set the parameters of our neural network to compute the AND function. So we've got two pieces of work we need to do here. We need to determine what these two weights are. And we also need to determine the parameter of our uh, activation function. We only have one target neuron here. So we only have one activation function, the one associated with this neuron. We're using, uh, we're using the step function here. So we're going to set some parameter here that whenever the raw sum, represented by x, is less than or equal to this value, we set the output neuron to 0. And if it's above that value, we set it to 1. OK, so we've got three numbers to determine. This number, this number, and the threshold. When this raw sum passes that threshold, we set the output neuron to 1. If it's below that threshold or equal to that threshold, we set it to 0. <coughs> what are those three numbers? One half. Sorry? One half. One half. So let's try that. So we've got uh, 0.5 for the left synapse and 0.5 for the right synapse. OK, so let's just leave that for a moment. Let's forget about the third number. So 0 times 0 0.5 plus 0 times 0 0.5 is 0. That looks good, right? 0 times 0 0.5 plus 1 times 0 0.5 is 0.5. So we've got a raw sum of 0 0.5 in this case. And we need the output neuron to drop to 0. So what does our threshold need to be? There's different things that will work here. What do all those different numbers have to have in common? Anything less than 1. Anything less than 1. So what about a threshold of 0? So we've got a raw sum of 0 0.5. And 0 0.5 is uh, less, uh, less uh, 0 0.5 is greater than, 0 0.5 is greater than 0. So we set the output neuron to 1. That didn't work. Anything between 0 0.5 and 1? Anything between 0 0.5 and 1 should work. Right? So let's set our threshold to 0.6. Let's go back here. 0 times 0 0.5 plus 1 times 0 0.5. The raw sum is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is less than our threshold of 0.6. So we set this to 0. Good. 2 out of 2 so far. This is looking good. 1 times 0 0.5 plus 0 times 0 0.5 is 0 0.5. The raw sum is 0 0.5. It's also less than our threshold of 0.6. So the output is set to 0, 3 out of 3. So far, so good. Let's do the last one. 1 times 0 0.5 plus 1 times 0 0.5 is 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 is 1. 1 is greater than the threshold. So we set our output neuron to 1. And we've now constructed an artificial neural network that computes the AND function. I think that 0 0.5 is also good for the threshold. Absolutely, right? So 0.5 would also, uh, would also work. That's correct, right? So uh, in my example here, I also had 0.5, and I set the threshold to 0.8. And you can see the little work in the bottom right there to make sure that our neural network actually works correctly. OK, I'm going to go on to the next slide. You don't need to copy everything down here as long as your weights are equal to 0.5 and the threshold is greater than 0.5. Okay. Now that hopefully you get the hang of this, let's try another one. Let's now take the same neural network, erase those three numbers, 
And we now want to set those numbers so that this neural network computes a different function, the OR function. What three numbers will give us an OR function? You could use halves again, and then just set the uh, threshold below 0.5. So the threshold is now lower, right? It's a little bit more forgiving. So if we just do the second row in our truth table here, 0 times 0.5 plus 1 times 0.5, the raw sum is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is greater than 0.3, so we set the output neuron to 1. Okay, so we've taken the same neural network. It has the same cognitive architecture. So the architecture is the wiring. Right? We have two neurons, one output neuron, we have two synapses. We took the same architecture, we changed the parameters, and we created a different mapping. Right? Now we have something that computes the OR function rather than the AND function. We could similarly take our robot, it's got an ANN inside, we make some changes to the ANN. That changes how the robot is going to move in react to sensor data. Right? In the same way that the truth table, the right-hand row in the truth table, is outputting different values given the same input as the AND function. Right? So by changing synaptic weights or changing thresholds, we're changing the mapping from the input vector to the output vector, or from the sensors to the motors. Okay, so in this case, I chose 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0 0.4. Anything that's below 0 0.5 works fine. Let's do one more. Let's do the XOR function. So the XOR function is the exclusive OR function, right? So it basically acts like the uh, OR function for the third, first three rows, but it excludes the last case, which is uh, both inputs are 1. <laughs> what are the thresholds and, or sorry, what are the weights and the single threshold that will give us an XOR function? You got the first two so quickly. Do you have to use one threshold number? Please. You have to use one, right? We're limited to three numbers here. Could you do like for input one, do like 0.5, and input two, do 0.3. So, and then when you have one, as long as it's greater than. Maybe. Uh, Doesn't work, right? Can it be negative, the weights? The weights can be negative, yep. The weights can be any floating point value between minus one and plus one. All right. I'm being a little bit tough on you this morning. Let me change my question to you. Is there a set of three numbers that will compute the XOR function? There isn't. Doesn't matter what you try, nothing will work. You remember we, when we were talking about uh, our brief history of AI, we talked about the first, or sorry, the second AI winter, which occurred in the 1980s. So early 1980s, neural networks were proposed. There was a huge amount of excitement at the time. Intelligent machines are just around the corner. Marvin Minsky, who passed away a year ago uh, on Tuesday, later in the 80s, he said, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. There are certain things that neural networks cannot do. It wasn't the XOR function, but you can go back and read the history. So he basically took all of the air out of this growing movement, right? And that brought on the first uh, AI winter. Unfortunately, at the beginning of that second winter, the... Uh, people working in neural networks said, well, wait a second, wait a second. Yes, we can. We just need to change the cognitive architecture. We need to add an additional layer between the input layer and the output layer. So there was actually a good rebuttal to Marvin Minsky's lampooning of neural networks, which is that if you have enough layers, you can actually compute any function. Fortunately, it was, it was too late at that point. Okay, so I promise you, uh, now there is a set of synaptic weights and thresholds that will compute the XOR function. Before we think about what those weights and thresholds might be, let's just talk about this architecture for a moment. We have our input layer up here and our output layer down here. And in the middle, we have a layer that's known as the hidden layer. Sorry, it's not on the slides here. Why is it called the hidden layer? Well, it's called the hidden layer because it's, it's somewhat hidden, right? It's not exposed to incoming values from outside. 
and it's not directly touching or in, it's not directly influencing the values that are arriving at the outside. It's safely hidden in the middle of this, this network. You'll notice that we have sort of a repeating pattern here, right? Hidden neuron one <coughs> receives two source neurons. Hidden neuron two receives two input neurons. And then finally, once we've computed the values of uh, the new values of these two hidden neurons, we pass those values on to the output neuron. Jeff? Um, wouldn't it just be easier to change your delta function at the bottom to have a to have a greater than, a less than, and an equal to? We could, we could make a more sophisticated activation function, a non-linear activation function, and then you could create a neural network with the previous architecture. But we're going to assume for the moment that our activation functions always have this not a monotonically increasing value. You're not going to give us the weights yet, are you? No. OK, I, question just, about. Yeah. Well, why does it always have to be increasing? Why can't you just switch the inequalities? So that it's always decreasing? So x is less, you could do the x or if x was less than or equal to 0, then output a 1. Or exactly. So we could, create, we could create more complex activation functions at the output layer that would allow us to do it. But we're going to assume that the only thing we really want our activation functions to do is to squash this value and it's always increasing. You're right, there are other ways we could do it. But the idea here is we're, we're going to try and limit the complexity of our activation functions. All right? OK. So um, let's, again, just talk about how to actually, how this is computed. So you'll notice I put a little right-hand arrow in these neurons here. The left side of the arrow is going to be the raw sum. So when we set the weights of these four synapses, we're going to compute the raw sum and put it on the left side of this arrow. And then we're going to apply our activation function with whatever threshold we decide. And after we threshold the value, we're going to, play, we're going to place the actual new value on the right-hand side here. So this is just a little bit of shorthand so that we can draw out how to compute this. So when we're computing uh, an artificial neural network, we take the out input layer, we compute the raw sums of the hidden layer, and then push them through their activation uh, functions. So we have now, we've computed all of the values at the hidden layer. Now we can go on to the output uh, layer and use the new values of the hidden neurons to compute the raw sum of the output neuron. Finally apply the last threshold, uh, last activation function to get the new value of this neuron. Before we talk about the actual synaptic weights, there are six of them we need to determine. We're going to set three different thresholds. What might be your strategy here? How do you start thinking about what these synaptic weights and thresholds should be? You're going to sort of compute two partial results and then combine those two partial results into the final result, which is the output you want. What might those two partial results be? What do you want them to be? Sorry? Inverse of each other. So Maybe. Not quite the inverse. What's the overall strategy here? The same as each other? If they were the same as each other, then we don't need two of them, right? So these two partial results are going to have to do different things, and then we're going to combine their results. What are those two different things? I gave you a hint when I told you about the XOR function. Right? So one results in a negative, then the other results in a positive? Possibly. So one could result in a positive, one could result in a negative. Getting a little bit closer. If one calculates the AND and one calculates the OR, you can combine those two results. Aha, uh -huh. OK. So if we get one part to compute the AND function and one to compute the OR function, that's good. We're almost there. What do we need? How do we, how do we need to combine the AND and OR results to give us the XOR results? Look at the table over here, right? The first three rows look like the OR function. And only in the last case are we going to do something different. So we need to know when the input layer is giving us that last case and then do something differently in that case. So the 
and function goes to zero. The and function, right, so it's going to have to somehow set this to zero. Okay, we're out of time for today, so we will leave this as exercise for the reader, and we'll uh, come back to this on Tuesday. You have a quiz due tonight. I'll post a PDF of the reading uh, in an hour or two, and uh, your assignment number two is due Monday at 11.59 p.m., and I will see you again on Tuesday. Thank you.